it's interesting that we were, ta we were talking last week about uh, believing. That's part of believing, that we've been talking about um, non-resistance and the letting go and uh, <clears throat> coming to a place where I can recognize where my resistance is and, and the possibility that my resistance and feeling the most resistance might be that doorway, that pathway that catapults me into something I never imagined, never expected, and have never experienced. Man, if we knew that, if we knew that those moments of resistance uh, were actually portals to experiencing something we've never experienced before, some type of transformation, some unexpected gift, some, some unintended inner reaction that is freeing. Man, if, we would, if we'd know that ahead of time, we'd be very non-resistant, wouldn't we? Totally non-resistant. We'd say yes to things that, you know, we might fear some fear, but we already know it's going to work out. Oh, what, a, what a great concept. God, would you please tell us ahead of time that everything's going to work out and then I'll follow? <laughs> I haven't met anybody yet that that's worked out for, uh -huh. that prayer. <clears throat> We're called into entering into the place that is most uncomfortable and the place that requires the most non-resistance. That's challenging. Is anybody truly capable of doing that? I don't think so. But we are capable of allowing ourselves to have the divine enter in and do that with us and in us and empower it. So what I like to say is, if you're st struggling with trusting God, then just imagine how much trust you have. You got 20%? Yeah. So that's not biblical. Well, I think it is because there was that one dude in the Bible where Jesus said he wanted to bring his son to get healed. And he says, do you have, do you have, do you believe? The guy said, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's me, man. Talk about wishy-washy, right? That's where uh, uh, the 100% the perfect demanding judging God would say, I'm sorry, man, I can't help you out. What is it? You believe or don't you believe? Come on. Either believe or get out. Or as they used to say back in the 60s, 70s, uh, get right or get left. You see the rapture thing, you know, get right or get left. And if that's the God you believe in, I think that's unbiblical. Because it says, I believe, help my unbelief. That means he understands us in our weakness. What if he just said, how much belief do you have? Uh, about 20%. Okay. Can I cover you on the other 80 how about if I give you the 80, you offer 100% of the 20. Could you release 100% of the 20% of the willingness to trust? Oh, that's different, isn't it? That's what it means was take my yoke upon you. When he said, take my yoke upon you, take my harness on you. You wear my harness, I'll take your harness. Your harness is way too heavy for you. You built it way too heavy. You got consequences more than anybody could carry. How about you let me carry that and I'll give you the burden of caring, letting go. What do you think about that trade out? What do you think about the trade out of us casting our cares upon the Lord of saying, I can't handle the consequences that I have created for myself. I can't handle facing the life that I have created in my humanness, in my fears, in my thoughts. I can't handle this, God. Okay, how about you give me that yoke around your neck and I'll put my yoke on you, which is grace. 
Would you be willing to I, I, yes, yes, I will take grace if you will guarantee me it'll work out in my favor. <laughs> okay. Um, I will I will take on all of your anxiety and your worry if you'll let go of the handrails. Well, could you put could you put the 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 new life like slip them into my hands without me having ever a feeling of being absent of the rails or of the training wheels? Can you eliminate the gap of unknowing, the gap of emptiness? Because if you'll do that, God, yeah, I'll follow. And by the way, would you smite that person over there while you're at it? Is they're really annoying me? Then I'll, then I'll do it. Then I'll do it. <sighs> That's, we can't negotiate with God. You can't negotiate with God for only one reason. If he gave you the pathway to absolute total freedom, why would you accept a percentage of slavery by holding on to your own control? And you know what? He knows it's hard. This God, and who, by the way, I refer to as he, but it's because it's the only language we have. Otherwise, I'd be leaving that space empty and going, because <laughs> it's a mystery. But he sympathizes with our weakness. Look at the scripture of meditation I gave you. And I don't know, I don't think the entire verse is there, but I'll read the entire thing to you. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, you know, just stop right there. You know what that's saying? Back, back in the day, I wasn't around, <laughs> obviously. But back in the day, what they did is they had priests who would carry the sins of the people into the temple. And they would carry, they would take their sins into what they called the Holy of Holies. And in that temple, there were several uh, walls that you needed to go through to get to the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies part where the Spirit of God resided and judgment was done, the high priest would take the sins of the people into that area and ask forgiveness for the people. Which meant that if he was going to go in there and ask for relief to the people, he didn't need to make sure he was pure. He needed to make sure that he had no sin in his life. Talk about a lot of pressure on a high priest. They were so concerned about it, they would tie a rope onto his ankle in case when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had sin in his life and he would die on the spot and then they could just drag him out and clean the temple. Okay? That was the ritual that was going on. So they needed a high priest who was going to carry the sins of the people to the whole into the holy of holies if you go into the catholic church you see the whole they have kind of a, a symbolic barrier uh that you see in, in the holy of holies kind of a thing the the sacred center of that place and so it would take the sins of the people so when paul is talking to the hebrews he's talking to a people which by the way a little piece of heresy on my part um they believe now that um uh, that's something you don't see in church very often. The pastor just walked over and shut the door. <laughs> um, oh, where was I? Okay, so they had a they had a high priest who would go before you. He had to have those that sense. I forgot what I was going to say on that part. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hebrews, that was a little side note, bonus material. Um, there are scholars now who believe that Hebrews was actually written by Priscilla, uh, who was a companion uh, minister of Paul's. Isn't that interesting? And then they penned Paul's name on it. You know why they would do that? Because they're lighters and cheaters. No. <laughs> because in that culture, if it was written by a woman, they wouldn't have received it. 
Wow, we've come a long way, baby. So uh, Priscilla, it's very possible that Priscilla was the author. And the way they do that is because they're just really smart scholars that can look at language and writing, compare it to other writings and look at that. And so maybe Paul and Priscilla together, uh, Paul, uh, Priscilla was writing that. So in Hebrews, um, this letter to the Hebrews is they are identifying. The Hebrews understand what that role of high priest was. They get it. You know, it's so neat when, when you can hear uh, a message in your own understanding, in your own language. When you hear a message um, uh, as an alcoholic or an addict, you, you hear it coming from, you hear the story coming from one who knows and who has been there. Or you're, you're listening to somebody who talks about the restoration of families who's had family restored and watched it and been a part of it and been through the brokenness. You understand that they've been through your pain. Uh, if you're grieving the loss of somebody, it's much easier to talk to somebody who has gone through the deepest, darkest places of grief, of loss, because you see the light of where they've been, the darkness of where they've been and the light of where they've come from. And so the high priest was to be that one which was a separation between them and God, where God would listen to the prayers of the high priest, not because of what he had been through and how he identified, but because he was considered righteous and pure and just and was able to take the sins of the people. Well, how long do you think those priests would stay in office if that were the case? Look at our time now. How long would you see any pastor stay in the role of that mediator between us and God if the requirement was that he needed to be pure and perfect and he needed to const constantly do acts of purification on a regular basis to make sure that he was pure? My gosh, I'd be spending a lifetime in the bathtub. <laughs> Wouldn't be a whole lot of living outside of that thing. <laughs> So that pressure of having to live up to that aspect of it. Guys, in our arrogance of thinking we know what's right, that we know what position and what opinion is right, when we know what the Bible meant to say, what it said, how it said it, when we choose our particular interpreter, our particular pastor, a particular politician, all it does is become a distraction to the most important part of our inner life, the holy of holies of our heart, of our spirit, and that's to have intimacy with God within the holy of holies of my innermost person where God says, I am your high priest where there couldn't be a high priest good enough. I have become your high priest and you are allowed to come freely into the holy of holies. And not only call me God, but Abba, Father. Abba meaning Arabic for Daddy. Daddy. What do you think the Hebrews must have thought when they were told that by Paul Priscilla? Slash. What do you think they must have thought? They would have thought heresy. Or, that's freaking cool. Are you serious? I can call that. I can call the father daddy. Yeah. Or if Phil, whatever you feel necessary, because he doesn't have a name, but come freely. I don't know. I don't know. I, I still kind of like to hang on to what is gripping me because I don't like. How, how can you turn down that kind of offer? How can, how can we turn down relinquishing chaos for peace, inner peace? I can't control global peace. That's pretty ambitious. I don't think I have enough Facebook quotes to fix that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't reach out and touch global suffering. I can't, I can't solve other people's arguments or problems, you know? I can't figure out the little challenges we face in this little community of wild goose. That's why we call it the wild goose, because the Holy Spirit can't be tamed. It doesn't float down with the softness of Michael Jordan and the voice of Morgan Freeman. 
It's wild and untamed. And you know what? When you surrender to it and you're non-resistant, you're just going for the ride. And your eyes are wide open. And you begin to see love in the room instead of being angry that there's not love in the world. And we have a high priest who says, I get that. I get your suffering. I get it. But I want you to understand something. Something. You have a high priest who can empathize. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Ah, oh, profession isn't just belief. When it becomes faith, then it's my definition. What I believe the definition for myself is on faith, not a lack of doubt, but action taken in the face of great fear and doubt. Action taken in the face of great fear and doubt. And the only way that we can understand that is to understand what character we're playing in the movie of our life, okay? We've got to understand the character that we're playing in our life. I don't like the idea of feeling like a victim or I am the uh, helpless person. I don't want to feel that, so it makes me react with stubbornness. You guys, it would make sense that I wouldn't want to be seen as a victim, or I wouldn't want to be the weak one, or I wouldn't want to think I'm stronger than I am. But unfortunately, when we do that, we're not admitting the true character we're playing in the own, our own movie of our life. I'll give you an example. Um, the Samaritan, the good story of the Good Samaritan, um, Jesus was making a point. And what he was saying is there's a man who was beat up and lying at the side of the road, and a priest came by. Okay, the priest that's supposed to be about good behavior and all that stuff, the priest come by. He's supposed to be the most religious one, the priest comes by and passes right by him. This is Jesus talking. <laughs> priest, priest passes by him. The Levite. Levites were a whole other tribe that was interesting, all about works and the letter of the law and and they were just, you know, didn't have time for that kind of, I don't know what to do, so I can't help you. And the Levite passes by. But the Samaritan, which is really funny that they call it the Good Samaritan because they didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were strangers from somewhere else. They were, they were not only hated, they were feared because they were hated, so they were afraid they would react upon the fear of other people. That was a complicated sentence, but if you just... Read the paper, you'll understand what I just said. Okay? Reacting out of fear is dangerous. Okay? So this Samaritan person that was ostracized, seen as a, a, bad, a bad person is, is coming by and turns into the good Samaritan without relinquishing his role and picks up the person beaten up, takes them to a hotel, says, if it's not enough, call me, I'll pay for an extra day. Um, get some, some stuff to eat. Jesus' point was trying to get it right and be holy and perfect is not a good negotiating tool for something that is given as a gift. The spirit was better off than the priest and the Levite. Okay? Because he understood who the character that he plays in his own movie is. It's not the Samaritan, it's not the Levite, and it's not even the Good Samaritan. It's the guy who's beaten up and lying on the street. We keep putting ourselves in the judgmental role of, oh yes, I should be a better person by being the Good Samaritan. No, I hate to tell you, but you're the one broken on the street. Huh, that's a switch. See, there's one side that says you should not be like the Samaritan, the Levite. You should be like the, the, the Good Samaritan. The other side is saying, you know, you need to get it together and be the priest and the Levite, but that story screws it up. But the third way, the mystical way, is recognizing I'm the person lying on the street, and I was never expected to pull myself up from my own bootstraps because I didn't get any boots when I went down to the family shelter uh, garage sale. So I need others and I need God and I recognize my condition and I am the one lying on the street. Did you ever see the 
the uh, video of uh, the story about the Hoyt father and son that raced in the Iron Man. It's a YouTube it. It's a spectacular video done by ESPN, and the background of the of the video is Nicole Mullen singing "My Redeemer Lives." Brings me to tears every time I watch it, because that that son is an adult um, that is ravaged with uh, cerebral palsy. Okay, cerebral palsy. What a what a painful thing to be physically visibly unable to function and not have people know that you are thinking just fine and not be treated as such. And his father and him are, are, are watching TV and he says, he says, son, hey, what, what, what would you like to do? And his son tells him, I want to run in a race. Okay. So his dad got some good tennis shoes and they went on a race and he pushed him as he was running, pushed him on this little cycle. And then he said, what do you want to do? He said, you know what? I want to go on another race, but I want it to be longer. The third time he said, I want to be in the Iron Man. Dad, let's go do the Iron Man. He's talking on his computer. And that good father says, cool, <laughs> we'll do that. And he starts training himself. He buys him and his son some tennis shoes. And if you look at the video, you'll see that the tennis shoe sitting at the doorway, one is completely worn out and sideways, and the other shoes look brand spanking new, and they're just as old. And the son, when they race into the Ironman, they do the, the swimming, and he puts his son inside a raft, ties the ropes to his body, and he's swimming and pulling the raft. And then after that, he goes through the uh, bike ride, and there, he's got him on the front of the bike. And then in the last piece, he's running, and he's pushing the son in the, in the chair, and his son is shriveled, and he's taking it in. The son, the father, you see the, the, the veins popping out of his neck and the sweat running down his head, and he's pushing the son. And as they're getting to the finish line, the people who really get it are staying there cheering for them, even though, and they didn't come in last, by the way. And they're coming across the finish line and there's water bottles throwing water all over the place. And when they get to the finish line, you know who crosses first? The sun. His bent arms, when he sees the finish line and he feels the water splashing towards him and the people cheering, he goes, and the dad is still about ready to collapse. Good works means we need to be the dad pushing. Grace says we have to recognize we're the one in the chair, and it was never intended to be any different. There's no negotiating. There's no negotiating because I can't do it on my own, and I was never expected to. There's no negotiating because this world operates and you should know better. You should get it together. And if you do get it together, then they want you to run for something or do this job. The expectations fall on you. You're the oldest. It falls on you to take care of the rest. Can't take it anymore. You do drugs, then it's the next person down the line. The expectations of the world are overwhelming. And Jesus says, that yoke you're carrying, let me know when you're done trying to carry it because it's wobbly and heavy. You can barely think your way through this. And I'm tired of yelling at me as though I put it on you. In this world, there will be trouble, he says. But I've got good news. I have freaking overcome the world. I don't think it said that. It said that exactly in scripture. I jokingly tell people quietly, but now I guess I'm not. I'm doing it in front of everyone. That I would like to write the F version of the Bible of Jesus' words. <laughs> if you would F and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and F and love your neighbor as yourself, we'd all be good. <laughs> Amen, 
Miss Charlotte. <laughs> Shine on me, Charlotte. <laughs> but that's, that's the intensity, you know, that he's crying out to us to say, I get it, I get the burden. But don't you have enough to worry about, concern yourself about? Don't you have enough of influence in your own world that you're going to need my strength, my hope, my peace, my joy? So lift up your hearts, all you people, and celebrate that you already have everything you need. You may not have everything you want, but until we recognize that the character we play is the one in the chair or the one in the gutter, and we keep caring, comparing ourselves to the Samaritan or the Levite, or yelling at the Samaritan and the Levite to stop being so, or the uh, uh, priest and the Levite, or yelling at the priest and the Levite that they should be more like the Samaritan. Don't you love the uh, uh, the, part the um, observers in the world shouting at everyone, saying you should be more like the Samaritan, and Samaritans you should be more like the priestly ones, and they don't realize they're with us lying in the gutter in desperate need. And the beauty of that is that nothing around us needs to change for us to grab onto that. If you go the other routes and play the other characters, everything needs to change, right? If you're the good Samaritan, you're banking on that person getting out of the gutter and making you look good. If you're a priest and a Levite, you're banking on them getting it together because they're making everyone look bad. But if you are the one in the gutter, you are utterly dependent on the God who loves you. And you will have an intimacy with God that others would envy. You'd have an intimacy with God that others envy. You become not only understanding God as Father, Abba, but you understand God as friend. And if there's any reason to understand the Trinity, then it's understanding that Jesus is the reflective nature of God's compassion who can empathize with us. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Let us walk in that which we believe. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. Doesn't that mean more when we understand what the high priest role was? But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not give in. He did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Wow. Makes us almost feel like we could go out there and do anything. That's the paradox. Strength and weakness. When I say I can do anything, I have limited power. When I say I can do nothing, except which God strengthens me in, I have unlimited power. You see that? When I say I can do this, or I should know better, and I should be able to do this, I am punishing myself and trying to make myself into a priest or a Levite, or the high priest of my own life. But when I say I will live the paradox of weakness, now everything is opened up. I'll close with this. There was a guy who dropped some weights on his neck, bench press. He could bench press a lot, okay? He was like ripple, ripple, ripple when he would flex, okay? And he dropped the weights on his neck. And they said that the amount of weight that fell on his neck should have crushed his trachea. And it didn't. And the reason they found out is that his muscles around the trachea had been worked out so much that they, pro or, uh, that they protected the trachea. That, when I read that, I was like, you know what? That's such a, a good metaphor for the spiritual life. We keep trying to strengthen the things that were intended to be weak, and we weaken the things that are actually strong. Quit trying to make your trachea strong because it's designed to have the timber and the resonation by its, its simplicity and its, and its fragileness so that it, it does good things when you speak, sing, and do other things. So you can try all you want to strengthen what was intended to be weak, but you can't do it. 
and you're putting your energy in the wrong thing. Strengthen the muscles around you. Access your resources. Talk to your loving friends without fear of they're gonna think that I don't have it all together. Be open with yourself before God. Open your hands, open your heart, and let God penetrate to cut between uh, soul and spirit and tell you the difference. To be able to cut between the word in the Bible and know the difference between judgment and expectation and compassion and love and err on the side of belonging, not behaving. So that behaving will become a fruit of the spirit, a fruit of the spirit, not a beginning to a better life, a fruit, a result of who I've been connected to, of who I've been hanging out with and who I truly call the high priest, the only one. It ain't you, it ain't me, it ain't the priest, it ain't the pastor, it is God alone. And when you do that, when you feel the expectations of others, you can say this wonderful line that I heard one time, I will always serve you, but you can never be my master. I have only one, right? I think that's a signal from God. <laughs> She's going to be my laugh track. We're going to get her in the studio and record that. <clears throat>